Welcome to Love for the Truth podcast. I'm Cindy Hartline. Now, we are in a pandemic crisis, whether we believe it is the cause of a coincidental virus or an intentional biological warfare from China or a political deep state agenda to keep President Trump out of the office or even the cause of a blown out, out of proportion media. The truth is, as President Trump says, we are at war with an enemy an enemy that is causing an affliction that will affect every part of our personal being and welfare for now and perhaps for months and years to come. The question is, is God Almighty graciously allowing this plague for a good reason? For a greater purpose? We know the story of Joseph and how he was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, but Through God's plan, Joseph became vizier, the second most powerful man in Egypt, next to Pharaoh, where his presence and office caused Israel, including his family, to leave Canaan and settle in Egypt during a great famine. He could have punished his brothers in his now powerful position, but instead he told his brothers, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you... You thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. I believe what the enemy has meant for evil, God has meant for good. You know, all through the Old Testament, God used hard situations to bring about good. He used plagues to get rid of evil and to bring those who did have a heart for him and his ways to their knees in repentance, beseeching him for divine guidance. Perhaps God is graciously trying to get our attention as we are presently in a unique place of stillness, being privately quarantined and at least six feet from one another. Perhaps He's wooing us to spend time with Him alone. Maybe it's a reminder that He is God and we are not, as Psalm 46, 10a says, Be still and know that I am God. Instead of being in fear of what the virus may do to us, maybe we should fear God and reverence Him by heeding what He is trying to say to us. Just maybe He wants to remove our soul-driven idols that demand our daily attention by closing malls, restaurants, arenas, movie theaters, businesses, and the like, and yes, even church organizations, as they too have become idols of some. Most veterans of the faith would agree that it is time to get right with God as we witness the prophetic birth pangs come quicker and harder. The earthquakes, tornadoes, locusts, and plagues all are a glimpse of what the tribulation will look like. Not pretty, though this crisis is actually a mild one in comparison to God's wrath. But it is time to wake up. Though many church buildings have closed, let us be reminded that we, as true believers and followers of Jesus Christ, are the church. We are the temples made without hands in which His Holy Spirit dwells. Sadly, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.3, many will fall away from the faith in the last days, from not having a sincere relationship with God, from being easily deceived by teachers of false gospels and from not having clean temples because of soul-driven idols, the perfect spiritual condition to receive the Antichrist. I believe the Lord is calling us to renew our hearts, repent of our inequities, and by the witness of the Holy Spirit, determine if indeed our spirit, our temples are clean and in right standing with God. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18 reads, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This passage is referring to Christians. Notice he will receive us if we touch not the unclean thing. 
You know, it's time to go back to our dad and ask for forgiveness. It's the unclean thing that's in the way. It's the unclean thing that hinders us from having an intimate relationship with Jesus, the lover of our soul. We are His temples made not with hands. He's a holy God and cannot dwell in an unholy temple. If we still abide in the muck and the mire of the world, what then are we saved from? And how will the Holy Spirit guide when grieved? We need to see salvation in the right perspective and work it out with fear and trembling. Yes, we are in a crisis. So what's the deal with the toilet paper and disinfectant supplies being the first on the list for survival in America? Well, you know, it made me think how cleanliness is still a part of our culture. Perhaps it's our Judea Christian upbringing and deep conviction that other countries don't have. A conviction that we need to bring to the forefront in our spirituality. It's time to clean up our insides and get right with God, whatever the sin is, whatever the idol. This is a grace period to do it, and it may not last for long. So take this moment to pray and ask God to show you the idols in your life that have taken much of your attention, precious time that should be intimately given to Him. Not that you will never again engage in or with whatever the idol is, but now it will not have precedence over God. Confess each idol through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and then give it to God. We're going to take a moment to meditate on all that was said here, and I'll be right back with the teaching on the importance of being set apart from the ways of the world. We're going deeper, so stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline. You know, I pray that you give this teaching a little more time. Let's go deeper. I'll be talking about the importance of being set apart. You know, all through the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible penned by Moses, the Lord taught the Israelites the importance of being set apart from the world and its ways. They were taught the practice of purity and cleanliness as it was counted as being holy before God. The Levites were the only tribe set apart as priests to conduct the sacrifices and tend to the tabernacle rituals. Instruments had to be properly cleansed and managed to be holy unto the Lord. They had to wash their hands and feet before entering the holy place in the temple. And a priest had to marry a woman from the seed of the house of Israel to keep the lineage of the Levites clean and holy. The Israelites had to bathe when they gathered in an assembly to hear Moses speak about God's commandments and the covenant he had with them. Cleanliness has always played a pertinent part of Jewish law and culture. Food and cooking preparation laws were mandatory. Many Orthodox Jews today still observe the law and abide by what foods and things are kosher, clean, and not kosher, unclean. Americans, for the most part, again, comply to their Judeo-Christian upbringing, perhaps without knowing it. At least we don't eat bats or dogs and shower only once a week. But strange gods and false gospels have entered the American courts and churches. The idols of man's opinions and philosophies of all kinds have changed our minds and in some cases have made some to think that good is evil and evil is actually good. Even the elect have been deceived. Well, in Genesis, God says, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Worshiping other gods was considered unclean. Adultery, fornication was unclean, along with other sins. Blood sacrifices were required for moral forgiveness, but it was the priest who would declare when a person or thing was indeed made whole, healed, and clean. Well, Jesus Christ, our high priest and mediator, determines what is clean and unclean. 
If you are a believer, it is His gracious sacrificial blood that covers our sins and declares us justified. However, the epistles in the New Testament give us a clear guidance of what our Lord requires of us to remain clean, sanctified, set apart from the worldly ways for our holy relationship with God to continue. Hebrew 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Is it me or do we seem to be far from having peace with all men and holiness these days, especially in the church? Today, some churches declare for themselves what they believe is clean and unclean, especially when it comes to holy matrimony, gender identity, and the murdering of unborn babies. The list goes on and on. Our culture is rampant with such abominable acts, and God will do what He has to do to correct us and to bring us to our knees. The enemy tries to thwart God's plan. But just as he thought he abolished Jesus' kingdom on earth, God the Father had another unique plan. Jesus' death and resurrection actually initiated his spiritual kingdom. The natural man and his righteous acts and deeds, doing what is right before God, is always interchangeable with the spirit of man. In other words, the way a person lives or conducts oneself usually depicts his or her spiritual condition. Just as we had to discipline ourselves from this viral enemy, we need to refocus on consecrating ourselves for the sake of holy God. The word consecrate in Hebrew is kodash. The word is used as for that which is sanctified, holy, dedicated, prepared, appointed, and purified, all signifying to be separated or set apart naturally and spiritually from a sinful and dirty, unholy world and life. Let's face it, we need to get clean. I've taken the following passages from my Prophesied Bride of Christ series to depict the Jewish ritual of mikvah and how it foreshadows New Testament baptism. We need to understand that though baptism is a ritual, it is also a vow to live a holy life. Mikvah in Judaism is a type of bath used for the purpose of ritual full body immersion, signifying spiritual cleansing and consecration, being set apart and getting closer with God. Jewish law required that one immerse in a mikvah as part of the process of converting to Judaism. When a Gentile ritually went down under the living waters of the mikvah, it symbolically meant that they were leaving behind their pagan ways dying to their old life and coming up out of the water, symbolizing the rebirth of a new life, cleansed with an entirely new identity. They were no longer a Gentile, but now a Jew, and their lives would never be the same. Their new life would have to succumb to the discipline of the Jewish laws. They were considered set apart, sanctified from identifying with the world they came from. Conversion to Judaism also included a public profession of one's new faith, participation in a covenant meal, and undergoing circumcision if they were a male. Judaism also required women to immerse in mikvah for purification before marriage as they were being set apart to take on a new name and covering. Interestingly enough, the outdoor or indoor mikvah bath was built atop of a living, moving water, such as a river, canal, or a spring, etc. A biblical mikvah must be constructed over waters that were made by God moving. Keep that in mind. Since the Jews were familiar with the ritual of mikvah, they understood well the process of conversion as mikvah is a foreshadow of baptism. Baptism in Greek is baptizo, which primarily means to immerse, be made clean, signifying being born again spiritually, having a change of nature. In the New Testament, John the Baptist introduced the baptism of repentance in Bethany on the eastern bank of the Jordan near Jericho. This baptism was preparing new Jewish converts for the way of the Lord, recognizing Jesus as their Messiah and King. The Jews understood that by making a public profession, repenting, circumcising their heart, and being baptized, immersed publicly, that they were positioning themselves as purified, set apart, and having a new nature and a new life. These first responders, baptized Jews, also realized that their conversion included being set apart under a new government, which could have cost them their lives in accordance with Herod's persecution laws. 
These newly converted Jews also understood that they were now subject to the law of the spirit of another kingdom, another government, with a different set of rules, statutes, and commandments. When Jesus, God who came to the earth, was baptized by John the Baptist, he said he did it for the sake of righteousness as he came to fulfill the law and not to abolish it. With that said, do we throw out being holy, set apart, consecrated, sanctified, and declared we are saved? If so, then what on earth are we saved from? Jesus' baptism also played a significant part in being appointed and coronated as the Messiah, King of the Jews. We read about Jesus' calling in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Jesus would be the anointed one, King, Lord, and Savior to all Jews and Gentiles who would believe and were baptized in him, as we read in the book of Acts. In conclusion, we understand that baptism did not originate with John the Baptist. The biblical ritual mikvah was a foreshadow of baptism that has been practiced regularly by all of Israel since the days of Moses. The Apostle Peter tells us that the waters of immersion is not the removal of dirt from the body, but one's pledge to keep a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we need to keep our minds clean, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ as stated in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Our hearts, souls, and our very being must remain clean and set apart as a holy vessel fit for the King. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Well, let us meditate on all that the Lord has said here during this very critical time. All of us, I believe, are in a fork in the road, a grace point in which we can make vital decisions to walk a different way, a way that is more pleasing to Holy God, a way that leads to a more intimate relationship with Him, a way of fulfilling the first and second commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let this be the best moment of our lives, and in doing so, we will thwart the enemy's agenda. For all things work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. Mark 1.8 says, I, John, indeed have baptized you with water, but he, Jesus, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, who will lead and guide us every step of the way. So be holy, for I am holy. Now, this crisis just may be the best thing that has ever happened in our lives. Let's walk the new way. Thank you for listening to Love for the Truth podcast. I'm Cindy Hartline. Until next time, big hugs.